Visual communicators can, com can become more visually engaging when you understand the basics of visual literacy and understand how to violate people's expectations of visuals, which is actually called or referred to as visual dissonance. Remember how we see and what the brain attends to. Something unexpected is always more expressive to the human race. So, Gestalt theory is a theory of visual perception. We need to understand Gestalt psychology so we can understand how to create images that have impact. So people, here's some basic uh, points that you need to remember about Gestalt psychology. The first, people attempt to impose a singular meaning on images. So what this means is the brain tries to make sense of confusing objects by organizing them in the most efficient way that they can. So philosophically, the question we should be asking is, what do you see, rather than what are you looking at? Visual perception is the result of organizing visual elements into shapes or groups. So Gestalt theory says that there is an unconscious automatic process at work, suggesting that there's this process of uh, compression and reduction of visual information. Um, and so people tend to kind of group things together. Uh, people see things in shapes or lines or groups. Third, people have a need to create clarity and order in their environment. The mind seeks stable, regular fi figures. Humans don't understand why they feel uncomfortable when they see irregular, unstable figures, but they do. And this is something, as visual communicators, we need to understand. So visual tension. Uh, visual communicators really get this. So to create tension or attraction, one must understand visual dissonance. Tension that occurs between um, what people expect to see and what they see. It's, it's a way of uh, getting attention because they are trying or humans are trying to reconcile with the image that they have seen. And this particular image is an example of, of that actually. Um, this, this here is actually a classic Gestalt illustration. So the figure and the ground are reversed. What do you see when you look at it? Do you see the vase or do you see a face? So what research shows us is that we tend to stop looking after we see the first thing. So if I see a vase, I only see a vase and I don't see the face. So we would have difficulty seeing the second one unless we were told that it was both a face and a base. So the concept of figure ground is our inability to recognize two different objects at once. We can only see one at a time. We have difficulty seeing both. So the figure ground principle is, again, you can't focus on both. Um, we can only see one thing at a time. FedEx actually uses this particular theory. Take a look at the logo. There's actually an arrow between the E and the X. Um, the arrow is only seen through conscious effort by the viewer. Here's another example of it. Do you see the figure in front of you or the background? Um, do you see the bottles or do you see the legs dancing? You want, typically when you use this principle, if you're actually applying it in, um, in, in images that you create, typically you want the subject to be dominant, um, just so it's more clearly defined. Um, ideally, according to this ad, you would see the actual bottle rather than the legs. Um, this is a Gestalt classic that was published in 1915. Do you see the wife or the mother-in-law? So it's primarily through our experiences which allows us to recognize shapes and which we've learned in previ the previous lecture. So we are often reminded by perceptual psychologists that we do not see what is there or we are pre preconditioned to see by need or experience. Uh, perspective makes all the difference. Uh, Thomas Kuhn argued that we have really not advanced closer to the truth as a society, but we just tend to simply change our perspective. Um, our perspective changes when we see something else. 
uh, our world evolves when we see the duck go to the rabbit. So there are four, uh, Gestalt has four general grouping principles. Um, the first one, proximity. And these are, these are really important to understand as a, a visual communicator. So a proximity is the first one. Um, things close together seem to be related with proximity. When two things are close together, uh, and they should be close together, but when they're, they aren't close together, then we tend to get uncomfortable. So the closer and the more alike the parts, the greater attraction among them and the greater the, the gestalt, or what we is referred to as good communication. So it feels right. Um, similarity, uh, similar elements seem to belong together. Um, gestalt theory says that objects that look similar will automatically be grouped together. There's kind of this sense of ease, this sense of harmony when we see this happen. We're gonna, I'm going to show you examples of why it's important to know this and why it's important to understand how to violate these group, grouping principles. Continuation. Um, so there's this natural flow of the object in one direction uh, when they're together. Again, we seek comfort. Um, if you want to put a person at ease, you want to follow these principles. Uh, discomfort them, violate these principles. And then closure. I'm going to show you images uh, of what I mean. So two items close to one another are closely related. And so we look at this particular picture. So we're not sure what to think about it when we look to the woman off to the side. She's not as close, but she's kind of looking off to the distance. And that actually brings up questions. Proximity is often used in design. We see that uh, like content, a uh, headline, and a summary graph, and a paragraph, that it tends to be close together and it shows that those particular items are related. Oh, I spelled proximity wrong there. Oops. Um, so tension. How do we create tension? Um, tension in this particular, uh, actually I spelled it right, um, tension in this particular uh, picture. So we look at this picture and it's an award-winning photograph and we see this woman and then this boy looking off, um, quite sad it appears. And this actually creates quite a bit of visual interest when they are actually not close to one another. So similarity. Uh, this this, this photograph is absolutely haunting. Um, so we see that the vulture and this starving child actually look quite a bit alike. Um, it's, but this image is absolutely haunting. It's a, a, it's a Pulitzer Prize um, winner in 1993 that's called The Vulture and the Baby. This is actually an image that's probably one of the most famous, is, famous images is to date. Um, so actually this photographer here, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but this particular fo fo uh, photographer, he uh, committed suicide three months after uh, taking this particular photo. No one really knows why, but um, there's a lot of speculation. But this, this photograph is actually a play on similarity. So is this particular one here. So take a moment and look at it. Um, you can see that um, similarity could consist of uh, size and color and length and form. And we can see here that there's somewhat similarity in the lines that are used throughout the photograph. Um, the snake is moving, moving in a rhythm, rhythmic kind of curvier linear line. Um, it, look just, it looks like the snake could actually be extensions of the actual body. So this is actually another award-winning photograph that kind of plays on that particular principle. Um, this is a photograph. Let's take a look at it. Um, so we can see that, you know, all the elbows, there's this, this similar pattern that kind of goes throughout this particular photo. Um, this is called A Mother's Journey. journey. Uh, it's basically a story of a mother and her uh, terminate, terminally ill uh, child. Um, but again, it's a very uh, beautiful photograph. Um, sim similarity, another why we seek, we get comforted, comforted by it is it actually occurs in, in nature. 
and here is another example of that. Now, if we want to create visual interest, most often what we want to do is it comes th through dissimilarity. So we contrast two things together and we can see here the sign against the particular line of people and the, how it's dissimilar and it creates this visual interest and brings up lots of questions. So if you want people to be attracted to your images, that's one way to go about doing it. And that's actually what newspapers did. Um, newspapers were these mind-numbing collection of words that were basically the same size. And so they they did understand that you needed a variation in font and font size to capture attention. So again, dissimilarity again is what the, takes the brain off of autopilot. So here we get seek comfort through continuance. Um, the brain seeks it, seeks as much as a smooth continuation as possible. Um, you can direct the viewer's eyes throughout images by groupings uh, and color. And viewers tend to close up the space between objects and perceive, perceive them as actually forming a line, such as in this picture. Um, so the viewer has this um, instinct to follow a path, a river, um, a beach line. Um, you should never shoot things straightforward. To create visual interest, you should always shoot things a little off to the side and create these lines. But this actually creates visual tension because this guy is actually looking off of the photograph. And so it's not quite following that straight line, but it is to some extent. So that's kind of cool. So when we look at this paragraph, you know, tension can kind of tear a picture apart and uh, present questions. And so understanding that people search for visual unity allows you to play on that necessity. Um, you can see here the person of clear interest is the person that is, is laying down there. However, off to the side, people are getting trampled on, they're getting hurt but our eye is attracted to the one individual who is off uh, from away from that particular line. Closure, uh, basically this is used a lot in de design and what our mind does is actually close up the actual picture or it closes up the actual line. So that's the actual principle of closure. So take a breather Okay, visual elements. Um, visual communicators can become more visually engaging when you understand the basics of visual literacy. And of course, as we are learning, understand how to violate people's expectations of visuals. Um, there are several principles of gestalt psychology that you can do to improve your visual communication. So we're going to talk about some basic elements of visual communication. So the brain responds to several common attributes of images, which is recognized in three forms, dots, lines, and shapes. Any visual communication class would talk about these, dots, lines, and shapes. So dot, of course, as you might expect, is the smallest unit of visual communication. Uh, dots have strong visual power to attract the eye, and a series of dots, as this particular image shows, can actually lead the eye in a particular direction. But if we look at this particular dot, you can see that its position and what it does and where it's placed, it communicates stability. So it's right in the center of the image. So if you want to communicate stability, you could put kind of this object in the middle of the frame. Uh, if you want to communicate something's unstable, you want to create tension, then put it in an odd space within the frame. And this is an example of that. And this is another example of that. And this kind of putting it in the corner suggests that you that this particular dot is isolated, um, that it doesn't have a lot of friends. And if you want uh, viewers to ask questions, put the kind of the object in, in a corner. It, it presents a lot of questions and, and uh, presents visual tension. So take a moment and look at the photograph. You'll find that you're not sure where to look. 
As we understand Gestalt, visual elements do not exist within isolation. So you see that right at the bottom there, that's the skier, and he or she is close to the edge or the corner, and this adds visual tension. So this is this happens when you force basically skier and the edge of the frame are kind of acting in opposition to one another. So this is a way to kind of play on tension and, and kind of uh, apply the example of the dot. So lines that are this, basically what they are is, is they're a series of dots placed next to one another and when they're close enough they uh, form lines. So lines have enormous energy. They're restless. They have direction. They have length. Um, we find that horizontal lines, if you want to present stability, calmness, uh, horizontal lines uh, will do that for you. Vertical lines are energetic and they carry a sense of movement and they're going somewhere. Whereas in this particular case, diagonal lines suggest a dynamic force, a, a feeling of um, vitality. So we can see that lines have quite a bit of energy. Lines have emotion and expression. So um, lines are also used in maps, information design. So let's apply lines to visual communication. And I tend to use pictures because we're in the field of, uh, most of you, of you are in the field of journalism, so I think it may be more relatable. So here we have, uh, so kind of what's fascinating about lines is that they do not occur in nature. They occur actually in human environments. If we think about it, um, roads, uh, sidewalks, telephone wires, bridges, buildings, uh, highways. So growing up in a technological civilization has made us more accustomed to being exposed to uh, artificial environments and lines. But what you should know about lines is when you present lines next to nature, it kind of creates these visual interesting shots. It kind of creates some tension. So we have here this, this lovely walkway against nature. And so that creates actual visual tension. So lines are a very important photographic element. Uh, lines can draw the viewer's eye into the image, such as this particular road does, if you look at the photo. We can see that it gives it kind of a sense of depth and distance. Um, different kinds of lines convey different emotions. Um, so we can see like a curved line, like those found in the path on a path or a river, are actually quite soothing. Um, and again, as I said, vertical lines, like um, uh, say a skyscraper, they convey power. So you can kind of subliminally create these messages and by the, the objects that you shoot. It's quite fascinating. Here we have lines create connection. Um, looking for lines in photography always makes it more interesting. So um, here you see amid the chaos, you see connection between the dog and the firefighter. There's a moment there. Um, this is an award-winning photograph, and it's uh, called Enrique, Enrique's Journey. So many teenagers uh, come to America through a very dangerous trek, searching for their mothers that have left them out of necess necessity. And so if we take a moment and look at this photograph, it visually represents that, this um, going somewhere yet not sure where. It's quite quite a beautiful photograph. So the last important component to understand is of course shapes. And so shapes are simply a combination of lines and dots together. So if you understand shapes in photography you can create messages that most people aren't aren't quite aware, they're feeling something, but they're not quite sure why they're feeling something. And so the three kind of basic shapes, and I'm going to talk about what they communicate visually. So the basic shapes are obviously, as you can see in front of you, circle, square, triangle, right? Okay, so let me show you how, well, shapes occur in nature. And uh, when you focus on shape, you're primarily concerned with the outline of a subject. It's kind of two-dimensional quality. But let me show you why it's important to understand these particular shapes and what they visually communicate. Um, so we have the circle. It's kind of a triangle too, but the circle. 
I am probably most attracted to the circle of all of the particular shapes. And circles represent uh, eternity, spirituality. Uh, curves re represent direction, uh, repetition, warmth, endlessness, protection. So when you shoot circles, you're actually communicating these things. It's kind of fascinating. Um, here's another example of warmth. Um, and then the two... Uh, animals looking at one another. Again, this warmth you feel from a circle and you just you don't quite understand why that is, but if you want to communicate that and make someone feel that way, shooting circles is one way to go about doing that. So squares, you can imagine, you know, that person is square. So when people say that, obviously they're saying that this person is dull or boring. Um, it also means honest, straightforwardness, um, a strong foundation. However, squares are rarely seen as beautiful. Usually squares are used to frame something that's actually visually interesting. And so we use squares quite often to visually frame something interesting because it's just not that interesting of a shape. Um, triangles uh, represent wisdom, uh, religions, uh, conflict, tension, action, direction. They're, they're quite they're quite interesting. They're just they're harder to find in, in nature. So there are many photographers who exhibit in major museums. In order to be a great visual communicator, you must kind of understand some of these basic visual principles that I've been talking about. Um, so good images do not only engage, but good images actually engage emotion. So if you understand how to uh, shoot and uh, create images that engage emotion, you're going to be a great visual storyteller. Um, I think a lot of you, at least a lot of you, would want to create images that move people. Um, but you need to understand how, of course, people process visuals. Um, so that's kind of really what I want to talk to you about is how to create that connectiveness. So aesthetics is a, is a study of beauty, basically, and the psychological responses to it. It's more complicated than that, but basically it's a branch of philosophy dealing with the nature of beauty and art, taste, and an appreciation for beauty. beauty. Um, it's about dealing with someone's taste and taste level. So I thought this was kind of interesting, so I thought I'd share it with you. So let's address what is beauty. Kind of look at that. So these are different cultures or classes. A high culture, what do they tend to like? They like abstract and art and things like that. Uh, upper middle, uh, you know, PBS, documentaries. Lower middle, representational, representational art. Um, so you can kind of digest um, and see that basically beauty uh, depends on our education, our income level, our occupational status. And that's where people tend to share similar notions of what is beauty. And uh, you need to understand this because that's how these particular uh, taste cultures, according to Herbert Gans, respond to um, and define what is beauty. So let's talk about a few more things and we'll be uh, done shortly. Volume. Uh, just to let you know, primary colors uh, uh, tend to, and darker colors, tend to appear heavier in nature. Um, if you want to show the size of something, then you need to usually show it in relationship to something else. This is also referred to as the contrast principle, but typically we want to show the size of something, we have to show it to something that we can relate to. Contrast, duality exists in nature, and so we are actually attracted to contrast, and so rough and smooth, big and small, light and dark. Uh, that's actually quite beautiful and striking to the eye. So golden proportion or golden ratio or golden mean refers to the magical proportion that has been observed to evoke emotion and aesthetic feelings. So this is important. It's harmon harmonious because people 
have already experienced or fam are familiar with it subconsciously in nature. So we're attracted to it. Um, and we, we do understand a little bit about this in visual communication, but we could understand it on a bit deeper level. So most of you are familiar with the rule of thirds. You know, again, this is what's visually pleasant, pleasing to the eye. It's how we see the world. And so this deals with the uh, golden proportion. This is another example of it. So when we're constructing images and we want, you want to create attraction to that image, you want to frame it in that particular way. And here's another example. The Fibonacci spiral is part of this. And so this particular spiral, the same mathematical formula is applied as if you were um, continuing through the progression of dissecting the golden rectangle into ever smaller rectangles. And so the spiral actually, the sequence is actually found in nature, just as like this particular seashell or a flower. And so you can see if you want to create points of interest you, and you want to kind of add that little spiral in the upper corner of an image and it creates this natural attraction to the image. Um, we seek harmony as we have been learning. Uh, balance is about harmony. If you want a person to feel peace or stability or reliability, you want to communicate those things, your shot should be balanced. And so that's one way to communicate that visually. If you want the person to experience stress, you want lines to go in multiple directions. And so if you were going to critique this photo, what kind of feelings would it evoke? Probably stress. Hopefully stress. Um, if you do, do not want someone's eyes to rest, and you can trick the eye because, again, we're constantly scanning the image, uh, blurring actually creates uh, visual interest. And so we have difficulty focusing and we're not sure what to focus on, even though this individual stands out a little bit more. So, you know, the concept of, of relative motion can be a great way to create interest, movement, or a attention. Here's another example of that. Uh, the t Japanese term boka. Uh, bake, I think it's bokey actually, which literally means a haze or blur. And so what it does is if you have lights in the background and you can kind of blur them out of focus, that actually creates visual interest. It kind of creates that multi-dimensional quality if you look at that particular photo. So as you learned, uh, higher classes tend to be attracted to abstract images abstract art, abstract images, they tend to cut through from the conscious to the unconscious. So it's kind of this sensory experience and that's why they're attracted to abstraction. And we can do this in photography. If we look at that particular image, that one, this is actually um, the photo of uh, of the Arctic Circle in, in Norway. Quite a beautiful photo. We can kind of blur the edges of lines to kind of create that abstract feel. And lastly, t I think lastly, <laughs> texture. Remember, uh, I, I believe that, you know, sublimity, we're going to want crave touch. And so uh, an image that is associated with the touch experience enri enriches visual communication. And so you can kind of create texture basically by shooting at a close range to reveal detail on the surface of the object. Um, you know, contrasting the smooth with the rough is kind of a cool way to create that textured effect. Um, this is a 9-11 photograph that kind of has that textured feel to it, but it's quite beautiful, obviously. Um, oh, and pattern. This is the last one. So find a compelling pattern is almost a guaranteed way to capture an amazing photograph. Um, patterns appear everywhere in our world. Um, the bark of a tree, uh, the honeycomb in a bee's nest. Um, 
So it sounds pretty basic, but if you start paying attention, you realize that there are quite a few patterns in nature and in your life. Um, so I would encourage you to start training yourself to find patterns. In most cases, simply zooming in on a pattern will kind of create that infinite uh, repetition. Um, so it's really cool. Just look for these in nature. It's, it's a beautiful thing to take photos of. And so that wraps up our lecture on uh, visual elements. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Bye.